gentlemen, dear colleagues, before I begin, um, I'd like to express my warmest thanks to Dr. Marek Jagodzinski, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to examine this uh, fascinating material from Tulsa. I'm very grateful for that, and um, I'm also grateful uh, for the chance to present this uh, research at, at the conference here today. Uh, the topic of my talk is Scandinavian amulets from Trusot and signals of belief in the Viking Age port of trade. I will begin this talk by giving you a, a bit of a wider context and some theory, and then I will move on straight uh, to the archaeological material from the site. Uh, Scandinavian Viking Age amulets have aroused interest of scholars since practically the 19th century, and over the years, numerous uh, definitions of these objects have also appeared um, in the academic literature. Uh, I have chosen only two um, scholars who recently published more detailed synthesis of Scandinavian um, objects that are labeled as, as amulets. Uh, the definition above was uh, published in 1997, and according to Miriam Zeiten, a broad definition of the concept amulet based on the etymology is an object which can be carried on one's own person, often in the form of a pendant, to obtain some form of magical advantage. Uh, a more specific definition is any object which by close contact to its owner or to any of his possessions works for his good either by warding off from evil from his personal property or by bringing him advantages. Uh, the word amulet is used rather consistently in any discussions of this uh, material that I'm dealing with in, in academic literature. However, some scholars have pointed out that the word amulet as such may not necessarily be an appropriate term. The problem is that when we explore the corpus of textual sources from, uh, uh, from the Middle Ages, that is the uh, Old Norse sagas or Eddic poetry and so on, we can't really find a word that would refer to these objects. We simply don't know how they call these miniature finds. And therefore, uh, in one of the most recent works or synthesis on uh, Scandinavian amulets, Bo Jensen also observed that it may not be the best term for uh, Viking Age miniature symbols, but it is a term established in tradition and we just don't have a better one, and we cannot really use a native Old Norse term for these objects. So I will also um, I will also use the term amulet as a kind of umbrella term for the objects that uh, that I'm examining today. Uh, naturally, the objects that are labeled as amulets by contemporary scholars they belong to a very broad sphere of what we could label as material culture of religious practice. A broad range of objects functions in this um, Viking world, which may have been used in, in rituals, in cult, uh, in magic practices. And this is just a small selection of uh, what has been found so far, ranging from the amulets that are the, the subject of my talk, through various kinds of figures, staffs which may have uh, been used in practices of uh, magic, masks, but also other ritual uh, paraphernalia. Speaking about the material culture of uh, religious practices, we also have to be aware that a lot of objects in that cultural milieu were decorated with very intricate designs, and these intricate designs could have also signaled intricate meanings, and uh, they may have referred to mythological concepts, to various gods, supernatural characters, and so on. In a way, it can be argued that these ornaments also formed a kind of a visual poetry of that time. And there has been some uh, interesting research in that field as well. Uh, over the years, as uh, the corpus of objects labeled as amulets has, has been growing, uh, scholars have distinguished various groups of uh, amulets or various types of amulets. And this is a list of those objects, uh, kind of amalgamated from various works published so far. And this includes miniature animals, anthropomorphic figures, amulets of natural origin, various beads in certain contexts, of course, capsules, clay bear paws, and that is a very uh, region-specific uh, issue, crosses in the Christian context, masks, miniature anchors, miniature bowls, miniature chairs, staffs, tools, weapons of various types, miniature wheels, some types of rings, runic amulets, 
Occasionally, Stone Age axes are even classified as amulets, and of course, the most famous of all, uh, the Thor's hammers. Um, we can say quite a bit about the use of amulets based on how they uh, were deposited and how they were found, especially in funerary contexts. Uh, and based on funerary evidence, we can argue that amulets may have been worn around the neck on a string or on some kind of a necklace. Uh, they could have also been carried in a pouch somewhere by the belt. Uh, some of them may have also been sewn onto clothing or perhaps between two different pieces of clothing between the layers of uh, textile. But there are also amulets which were attached to other smaller or larger objects. There may have been amulets attached to structures, houses, and some amulets are also found in hordes, perhaps providing a kind of uh, supernatural protection for, for these finds, or simply representing yet another, for example, silver find. Uh, what you can see here is, uh, is a reconstruction we made uh, last year during a project uh, I ran in the Isle of Man, and this is a, a reconstruction of uh, one of the graves discovered there uh, at St. Patrick's Isle, uh, a grave of a so-called pagan, uh, pagan lady and she was also buried with a very broad repertoire of uh, rather special objects. Um, moving on from this introduction to the Scandinavian amulets from Trusso, it is also possible to distinguish a range of categories uh, for these finds. As you can see in the chart here, uh, the largest category is, of course, the category of Thor's hammers, and you could all see them today at the exhibition. Uh, most of them were made of iron, but there are also some uh, perhaps problematic amber examples. There are also some miniature figures made from silver and copper alloy, uh, but also miniature weapons. There's also a single find of a miniature wheel, what I have labeled as a, a miniature staff, and I will explain why. A miniature anchor, and of course a tripart amulet, uh, which has been used as the logo of, uh, of our conference. Uh, the Thor's hammers found here display various features and they could uh, potentially be divided into a range of types. And I have tried to distinguish these types, uh, indicating the, the, the various variant, the, the different variants that we have. Uh, so Thor's hammers with equal or uh, symmetrical shoulders, with rather short shoulders, and on some of them you can see a loop at the very end, which would allow for suspending them on a string. Uh, there is also a group of finds which I'm not certain whether they actually are Thor's hammers or perhaps just miniatures of working tools, miniature hammers. I was unable so far to find direct uh, parallels to this material in the Viking Age Scandinavian material. Uh, they may be some kind of a local variant, maybe they belong to a different ethnic group that lived there. This still remains uh, an open uh, question, uh, and a question to which I don't really have a, a final answer at this present moment. And then, of course, Thor's hammers with rings, uh, very small rings. This is not the same thing as a Thor's hammer ring, something much larger and known from, from uh, Scandinavian and Rus context. They're very tiny. Uh, there is one example where a single Thor's hammer has been attached to the ring, and the other example with two uh, supplementary pendants, perhaps in the form of miniature spears, <coughs> and one of them has also been interpreted as a miniature of a sword, with the Thor's hammer in the central place. Uh, I mentioned the amber uh, objects, uh, some of which may have been Thor's hammers or crosses, or perhaps both at the same time or depending on the context. And there are also some objects which by Dr. Jagodzinski have also been speculated as being uh, potential force hammers. Well, we don't know. They, they may be half products, they may be unfinished objects, they may be damaged objects. I think this, this has to be taken with a, with a degree of caution. Uh, moving on, another very interesting category of finds from uh, Trousseau is represented by miniature figures, most likely uh, female figures, as indicated by the long uh, garment, but also the very 
characteristic hairstyle in the form of a, a knotted ponytail at the back of the head. Uh, usually these objects are uh, represented as uh, Valkyries or as representations of Valkyries and this idea can indeed be true but we also have to bear in mind that in the uh, Scandinavian or Norse or Old Norse world of thought the Valkyries are not the only supernatural creatures that uh, had interactions with the human world and therefore these miniature figures if they represent any supernatural creatures at all could quite likely be things like Nornir, Bisir, uh, Fildjur, Völur, either human or supernatural, we, I think, have to uh, admit that we simply do not know what these objects uh, represented, especially in cases where there are no clearly distinguishable attributes. They are not holding anything, they're not carrying anything, so it's really hard to say. Uh, here are some parallels from uh, Scandinavia, most notably from Sweden, but these objects also appear in the Rus territories. And this is a, a very interesting find, uh, unfortunately fragmentary. Uh, I labeled it as a standing figure and horse rider. Uh, as you can see, it's only partly preserved, only one half of it exists today. But based on comparative uh, finds from other sites, particularly from Denmark, what is very interesting in the case of this uh, this object is that the person, the, the, the character that is standing in front of the horse appears to be carrying or holding uh, a, a shield beneath which protrudes the tip of a sword and as you can see below the figure is also wearing a kind of trailing dress and some kind of conical headgear. This dress might imply that the standing figure is actually a female. What is interesting is that when we look at the comparative finds, from, uh, especially from Denmark, but they're also known from England, uh, it seems that not only the standing figure could be female, but also actually the rider, as implied by the knotted uh, hairstyle, uh, the facial features. Uh, what these finds represent, and again they have been interpreted as Valkyries, is still unclear. They may be representations of the Valkyries. Perhaps they are also representations of something else. And maybe they refer to actual reality, that is, females going to battle armed. Of course, this requires a lot of discussion, and I can't go into detail. But there is an idea that something like that existed in the Viking Age. Uh, I've been looking for more direct parallels to the two find, and so far I've been able to find one which is equally schematic because as you can see before these are quite realistic in their design and that is a find from Norfolk in England, unfortunately a stray find, it doesn't come from a grave, we can't really say who used it and how, but you can see the same kind of incised lines, again a standing person probably carrying a shield. And one detail here that usually doesn't appear on the Danish examples is a shield carried on the horse. Again, the detail of the hairstyle implies that this is also a representation of two female characters. Uh, there's recently quite a lot of discussion about the potential uh, existence of warrior women in Viking Age Scandinavia and indeed there are some hints that something like that may have existed beyond the pages of the texts or beyond the imagination. Uh, there are some graves in uh, Denmark, Sweden and Norway which contain weapons uh, in the context of females but of course funerary archaeology is extremely complicated and we cannot always say that graves are mirrors of life. We cannot really say that a woman buried with a weapon was a warrior. It is a possibility, but it's not a certain thing. So it always, uh, it always requires a discussion. And these are just two reconstructions that were made for, uh, actually for my PhD thesis a couple of, of years ago, of uh, two graves from Denmark with objects uh, such as weapons. Um, another very interesting object uh, among the corpus of uh, strange finds from uh, Prusso is this female head. Uh, originally, uh, Dr. Marek Jagodzinski interpreted it as a head of a pin, and it may indeed be part of such an object. 
There is also a possibility that the head actually represents a part of a larger uh, figure. Uh, quite recently, this object has been found. Again, it's actually a female holding a shield and a sword. Uh, but the Horvi uh, figurine is very tiny. It's, it's smaller than my, than my little finger, whereas this head itself uh, measures about three, uh, three centimeters in, in length. <coughs> so the figure, if it was a figure, would have been considerably larger. Uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege to examine this find in, in Trusso last year in winter, and I shouted to Dr. Marek Jagodzinski when, when I looked at it, because there is a very interesting small uh, detail, or rather lack of it, on this object. If you look closely enough, you will notice that the, the proper right eye has a clearly distinguishable pupil, while the left eye seems to be missing. It's either never been made, or it was deliberately removed at some point. This, of course, brings forward interesting associations with Odin, who sacrificed his eye to gather wisdom and uh, the knowledge of what has remained uh, hidden to him for a long time. Uh, and it may be so that it has something to do with the beliefs uh, associated with Odin. Uh, the find is unique because, to my knowledge, it is the only a uh, rather positively female object with altered eyes, but it is not the only object <coughs> in the Scandinavian or Anglo-Saxon world which has uh, modified eyes. These are just a few examples, there are more, and uh, recently Neil Price and Paul, uh, Paul Mortimer have published a paper about it in the uh, European Journal of Archaeology, arguing that the practice of deliberately removing or altering eyes in uh, Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian objects may have had something to do with uh, Odinic beliefs. A uh, pendant from Riba with a struck-out eye, a bronze helmet plate die or a patris from Toslunda with, again, a removed eye. Uh, the eye was originally there and someone just punched it out. And the Sutton Hoo helmet. Uh, some of you may know that the garnets above one of the eyebrows uh, had a golden foil, whereas the other eyebrow did not have the golden foil. And when the replica of the helmet was made and tested in the hole, it appears that when the fires are glowing, one of the eyes remains dark and the other one shines. So it's like someone is basically reenacting Odin, you could say. Um, it's very interesting, very interesting stuff. Uh, another object which, uh, which is also equally interesting is this miniature pendant that I labeled as a miniature staff. Uh, this, is a, this is an object, uh, again, a couple of centimeters in length, with what could be labeled as a kind of basket handle. Uh, there is a, quite a broad repertoire of similar objects, yet much larger in size, known from uh, predominantly Norway and Sweden, but also Denmark, uh, which over the years have been given various interpretations. Originally, they were interpreted as roasting spits uh, for, for roasting joints of meat. Uh, they were interpreted as measuring rods. They were interpreted as lamp fragments, uh, fragments of other objects. There's a whole literature on the topic. But uh, some scholars, uh, including Neil Price and myself, uh, have argued that at least some of these objects could have been used in the practice of, uh, of sorcery. Uh, this interpretation has to be approached with caution. I had the opportunity to examine all of these finds as part of my uh, doctoral project, and I would say not all of them could have been used as magic stamps, but at least some of them in the context of their deposition and manufacture strongly suggest such a possibility. If not, these objects themselves can bring a whole range of interesting associations. They can be associated with uh, roasting, but they can also be associated with measuring, and they can also be associated with a very interesting practice, that is the production of thread, with spinning. Uh, as part of my earlier project, a uh, PhD project, uh, we made a full-size replica of one of these staffs, 
Uh, the subject has never been shown at a, a Viking conference, so you're probably the first one to see it in real life. It's a, it's a full-size replica based on a find I studied in uh, Staffens Historiska Museum in, uh, in Stockholm. Um, I don't use it for magic or anything. <laughs> I, I made it as an experimental archaeology project with, in, in collaboration with several uh, modern crafts workers. And uh, this is my colleague who tried to use it as a distaff, and you can indeed use it as a distaff. You can use it as a roasting spit. It's basically a stick, so you can use it for anything a stick can be used for. But uh, I believe that objects of this kind, in certain contexts, could have also brought forward these associations with magic. Particularly spinning is interesting, because we know that the practice of spinning, producing cloth, producing textile, uh, had a lot of associations with aspects of fate, uh, shaping human fate. And perhaps a, a seeress or a sorcerer carrying stuff like that indicated the ability to change the fate of those whom he or she encountered. Uh, I don't want to talk for too long, but uh, there's also a range of other miniature objects from Tusa which are equally interesting. And these include miniatures of weapons, such as uh, the miniature shields, uh, three miniature axes made from amber, although these may not necessarily be bound only to the Scandinavian uh, population living there. Uh, a silver miniature wheel, a miniature anchor made from tin, and anchors like that so far have been known only from Hedeby and York, but there's also another as yet unpublished find from Wolin, in fact, which is made from lead, so we have two objects like that from Poland. And then there is this find, which is a problem in itself. Uh, it may be uh, some kind of a half product, production waste, or perhaps it may be a very crudely made uh, miniature foot or shoe. And there are finds that are more realistically carved uh, from various places in Scandinavia, including Hedeby, Birka, Kaupan, and so on. Uh, and of course, one of the last objects that I would like to show you is a, is a find you all know very well already, and uh, I'm sure you, you have also read uh, Dr. Jagodzinski's interpretation of this find, a tripart amulet uh, from Trusso, consisting of two dome-shaped strap distributors between which a silver ring was placed, and it was deposited like that in the ground between two buildings. Uh, Dr. Marek Jagodzinski had a very interesting interpretation of this object in the light of Old Norse beliefs, arguing for its connection with uh, the god Thor and the giant Thribadi. And this interpretation is indeed possible, uh, but there is also a possibility that uh, maybe this is not an amulet per se, and perhaps this object represents some form of sacrificial deposit that somebody placed in the ground with some magic intention in mind. Uh, we have to bear in mind that there is a ring inside this, and in Scandinavia, rings were very potent, very powerful objects on which oaths were sworn. So perhaps my idea is that perhaps someone swore an oath on this ring and buried it for safekeeping or for, for closing of a ritual they conducted in the ground. We will never know. Uh, what is interesting is, of course, the triquetra uh, symbol, the three corners, the three heads, and also the fact that the very object consists of three parts. So you have the number three repeated here continuously, and of course number three, number nine, and multiplicities of these numbers are very important in Old Norse religion. And so is the triquetra symbol, which appears on the various objects, from Thor's hammers to weapons, especially axes and coins. The truth is, we don't really know what this symbol means. Uh, recently, Tom Hellers, uh, a student of Professor, Do uh, Professor uh, Rudolf Zimek, wrote a very interesting thesis about uh, Valknut. Uh, but this symbol is not a Valknut. It's a triquetra. A Valknut is a slightly different uh, design consisting of three triangles. In fact, the name Valknut comes from modern times, from 18th uh, century, uh, and therefore uh, Tom Heller suggested that the triangular symbol uh, should rather be called something like a Norse triangle symbol, basically. We don't know how, again, uh, the people of the Viking Age 
hold it. Clearly, this is a symbol of some significance. It has to do with the number three, and therefore, the fine from Trousseau definitely belongs to the sphere of magic practices. The only problem is we can't really say exactly what it was used for. Uh, so to conclude, and uh, of course ask further questions, uh, the excavations in Trousseau revealed various types of Scandinavian amulets, uh, and I haven't shown you all of them today, because th th there's simply no time for that, uh, including Thor's hammers, miniature figures, and miniature weapons. These are the, the most representative groups. But also a miniature wheel, a miniature staff, uh, possibly a miniature foot and shoe, and the tripart object uh, you just saw. Uh, they have parallels in different parts of the Viking world, uh, most, uh, most of all in, uh, in Sweden and in Denmark, but also in Rus. Uh, we do not know as yet if these objects were produced on site or brought there from afar. Uh, no molds for casting or producing these objects have been found. Uh, perhaps future excavations will help to reveal this. Uh, and we do not know who exactly used these objects and how, uh, because they are all finds within the settlement and not finds from graves. We do not know if they belong to men or women or children, old or young. We simply cannot say. But we can say from comparative materials from Scandinavia that, for example, Thor's hammers, when we look at graves, they appear most often in the graves of women, so perhaps this was uh, a female adornment, but they also appear in graves of men, so it's not something that is so clear-cut. And the same goes for the female ornaments, pendants or clothing appliques. Uh, we do not know if they represent accidental losses, it just fe if, if they just fell off somebody's necklace or from somebody's pocket or pouch, or if they represent uh, intentional deposits. In my view, uh, only one of these objects, that is the tripart amulet, would uh, most likely represent an intentional uh, deposit. As, as, as in the case of other finds, we just don't know. Uh, uh, Professor Duchko uh, wished uh, Dr. Jagodzinski another 34 years of research in, in Druso, so I think <coughs> within that time span there will be more uh, finds of uh, <coughs> Scandinavian type amulets. Uh, but for now, this is, uh, this is the majority of the most important finds that have been discovered now. Thank you very much.